will rain hell down from on high. In a few days, we'll be getting the much-anticipated, much-delayed online release of Tom Hanks' new movie, Greyhound. Now, this is based on the C.S. Forrester book, The Good Shepherd. Forrester, of course, is better known for his Horatio Hornblower novels. And the book features the fictional U.S. destroyer USS Keeling, which goes by the radio call sign George as it fights the Battle of the Atlantic in World War II. Now, in the movie, it's still the fictional Keeling, but it now has the much cooler radio call sign Greyhound. I guess George just doesn't make for a very good movie title, but it's still a great name. Destroyers, after all, are known as the Greyhounds of the Seas. Now, this is a great shot. It features a very historically faithful view of what a convoy would have looked like in 1942. And they've also nailed the colors in the PBY Catalina. This is exactly what you'd see in a Catalina in this part of the war right down to the national markings. And of course, air cover from Catalinas and other aircraft would be very, very important in defeating the U-boat menace. You've also got a great shot of the heroes of the film, the destroyers and the other escort craft that will feature very prominently. On the left-hand side, you have the Keeling herself. Now, in the film, she's a Fletcher-class destroyer. And this is a little anachronistic. Fletcher's didn't reach service until mid-1942, and the film is set in early 1942. But the producers still win a lot of points for historical faithfulness here, because they actually shot the film on a real World War II destroyer, the USS Kidd. Now, in the center, you can see a British-built destroyer. This looks like an N-class destroyer. And this is probably meant to portray the book's ORP Victor, a Polish destroyer that goes by the call sign Eagle that's based on the real Polish destroyer ORP Piron, which was also an N-class destroyer. Now, at the far end, on the right side, you can see a Corvette. And this poor Corvette is having to probably work very, very hard to keep up. The max speed for these tiny ships was only about 16 knots. And speed is actually a very tactically significant part of the real Battle of Atlantic, and it's also a major plot point in the book. Faster destroyers can rush out to prosecute U-boat contacts since they, can, since they can get there faster and they can catch up with the convoy more quickly. And we'll see if this ends up being a plot point in the film as well. Dear Lord, let your holy angel be with me. That the evil foe may have no power over me. So this is one thing that the movie gets partly right and partly wrong. It wasn't uncommon for German submarines to have the kind of conning tower art that you've seen. Um, however, the conning tower art tended to be smaller, and it tended to be more whimsical, irreverent, and a lot more cartoonish. Things like U-47's famous Raging Bull cartoon, or Mickey Mouse, or Cartoon Sawfish. These look a little bit more like something out of Warhammer 40k, and by and large, they didn't look that badass. German submarine crews had a sense of humor, and their conning tower art reflected that. Into your hands I commend myself, my body, and soul. Amen. Now, these kinds of ultra-close-range engagements between destroyers and U-boats absolutely did happen. There are multiple cases of this. Now, this U-boat, it, it's, it's trimmed a little bit high in the water. It would probably be sitting a bit lower in the water, and this would actually create a lot of problems for destroyers because they couldn't depress their guns low enough to actually hit nearby U-boats. Uh, one of the best-known examples of this happens in November 1943. The destroyer USS Bo Bory, an old four-stacker, rams U-405 but can't finish her off. They're so close that the crew of the Bory end up resorting to firing rifles, pistols, and flare guns into the stricken German submarine. At one point, the ship's ex executive officer, the XO, was actually firing from the bridge with a Tommy gun. Uh, another sailor threw a knife and hit a German U-boat crewman. Another one threw an empty four-inch shell casing and knocked a German overboard. Uh, and eventually, the two were able to break away and the Bory was able to actually bring her guns to bear. But this is an example of multiple cases where destroyers and submarines got so close to each other, they ended up having to resort to improvised weapons. There's another probably apocryphal story of the crew of the USS O'Bannon throwing potatoes at one Japanese submarine that got too close.
congratulations on your command. I'll always be looking for you, Evie. Even if I'm a thousand miles away. So here we have a better view of the convoy. And again, this is a very, very historically faithful arrangement. You can see perhaps the escort ships at the front of the convoy screening for submarines. And you can see the neat columns as well. And in the center, you can see a very, very large ship. That's probably a troop ship. And historically, the most high value ships, oilers, uh, troop transports, other valuable ships were placed at the center of the convoy to give them the maximum amount of protection. So whoever did the visual effects for this film got the convoy organization spot on. Air escort to Greyhound. You will now be out of range of air cover for the next five days. Now, this is another particularly good nod to history. The Mid-Atlantic Gap was a particularly crucial part of the Battle of the Atlantic. Until about 1943, with the arrival of very long-range aircraft, air convoys crossing the center of the North Atlantic were out of range of air cover from Britain, Iceland, and the United States. And this was obviously where U-boats wanted to hunt because they didn't want to get tracked down by aircraft. And this mid-Atlantic gap, depending on the speed of the convoy, they were fast convoys and slow convoys, took different amounts of time, and it was usually about three to six days to cross. So five days out of air cover is a very, very realistic figure. It also tells us this is probably a slower convoy with a maximum speed of about eight knots. These would be categorized as SC convoys and the convoy code system the Allies used at this point in the war. Safe travels to England. How many crossings does this make? This is my first. So you can see here the, just the radar on the USS Keeling has picked up a U-boat contact. And this is absolutely something that the SG, the Sugar George radars, fitted to US destroyers could absolutely do. Again, this is a little anachronistic. Most of these radars weren't reaching destroyers until mid to late 1942, but this is absolutely a capability destroyers had. They could pick up conning towers or, in good conditions, even the periscopes of German submarines from a reasonably good distance. I got some. Most likely a U-boat. He shot us the front of us! Fire! So we get a great shot here of one of the most important weapons a destroyer had, and that was the K-guns. Destroyers could roll depth charges off the back of the ship, obviously, but to maximize the spread of the depth charges, they would also fire, destroy fire depth charges off the side of the submarine using these devices called K-guns. And these would end up making a much larger, much deadlier spread of depth charges for U-boats. Here we have a great shot of another one of the escorts that will hopefully be featured in the film, and this is a Flower Class Corvette. Now, this is actually the Canadian Corvette HMCS Sackville, the last Flower Class Corvette anywhere in the world. And the producers actually scanned this ship for the purposes of the film. Now, in the book, this is also a Canadian Corvette, which goes by the fictional name HMCS Dodge. This is another particularly historically faithful detail. One of the ways that they would confirm U-boat kills during World War II was to look at the oil slicks. They presumed that if you blew up a destroyer, oil, you blew up a submarine rather, oil would be released and that would be a way to confirm the kill. But sometimes there were even grislier ways to confirm this. It wasn't unheard of for crews to find body parts. Uh, one U.S. Navy destroyer in the Pacific found a lung from a dead Japanese submarine crewman, and the doctor actually examined it and found the owner had tuberculosis. But U-boat crews would also try to fool destroyers sometimes by jettisoning oil and debris, so gruesomely, finding body parts was often the best way to confirm that you'd actually killed a submarine. We have a kill. Distress rocket, sir. We have hits directly on the convoy. The wolf bag's haunting us. You both starboard bound! In 48 hours, we've lost seven ships. So this is one of the things that is, uh, hopefully that will also be featured in the film. It's featured very prominently in the book, and that's the role of rescue ships. 
With so many ships being sunk in the Battle of the Atlantic, every single convoy ideally had at least one rescue ship. This was usually a large ocean-going tug that would pick up survivors and try to tow stricken ships to safety. Now, there's one other detail that I want to rewind and show real quickly, and that is this U-boat right here. Now, if this U-boat is actively attacking on the surface, there should be some people on deck. Usually there would be the skipper, the Einsvo, the first watch officer, and his job is to man what's called the U-boat Ziel Optik, which is a big binocular with 14 inch lenses. And this will pass the target bearing, range, target angle, down to the big torpedo data computer below deck. There'll also be anywhere from two to four lookouts on deck, keeping an eye for incoming enemy warships. So if this U-boat is actively attacking on the surface and isn't about to dive, there should be people on deck. And we'll see if the film features that when it's released in theaters. What you did yesterday, got us to today. It's not enough. Not nearly enough. Yeah, this is absolutely true, uh, although most people may not realize that the branch of the U.S. Armed Forces or the U.S. services that took the most casualties in World War II was actually the Merchant Marine. Over 9,500 merchant sailors died during the war, almost all of them in the Battle of the Atlantic, and 1 in 26 Merchant Marine sailors was killed. By contrast, 1 in 34 Marines was killed. One in 48 army soldiers was killed, and one in 114 sailors died. And, of course, the U-boat crews had it even worse. Nearly 39,000 men served in U-boats, and over 30,000 of them died. Only about one in four German U-boat crewmen lived to survive the war. Targets disappeared, sir. And this is one piece of historical license that's featured in the book that seems to have been carried over into the film as well. Uh, German U-boats didn't taunt Allied convoys during the war. Uh, German U-boats did sometimes have radios that could pick up the talk between ships, voice radio communications that Allied escorts used, but they didn't have a radio that could talk back. In fact, they couldn't even talk to other U-boats. German U-boats that went to sea in the Battle of the Atlantic did not have voice radios that could be used to talk to other ships or other submarines. So this is a little bit of uh, touching up on the part of the filmmakers and C.S. Forrester as well. Now this horde of U-boats appearing on screen is also not entirely historically faithful. By and large, U-boats did not coordinate their wolf pack attacks. While U-boats would converge and attack in large numbers, these attacks were done by individual U-boats operating individually, and because it was different U-boats converging from different directions, they tended to attack the convoy at multiple different points at multiple different times during the night. And this was actually something that U-boat commanders wanted to do. They didn't want to have a bunch of submarines attacking all from the same direction all at the same time. It was a lot easier for escorts to get hit to uh, attack those submarines. There was the risk that the submarines could torpedo each other. And it also meant that they would be getting in each other's way. They wouldn't be able to hear, each hear real well because they would have to listen to other submarines. And when a submarine's underwater, its most important sensor are its hydrophones. So by and large, U-boat commanders would end up ta attacking from different directions in uncoordinated attacks. You wouldn't see this kind of massed attack like this. Here they come. What are we going to do? We'll ring hell down from on high.
So I am very much looking forward to this film. It seems like it's going to be very faithful to C.S. Forrester's original book, and it seems like they've gotten a lot of the history right. Although, of course, some things have been Hollywoodized a little bit. But this has the potential to be a great movie, and even more importantly, in my mind, a great historical movie. So I'm really looking forward to it, and I hope you enjoy it as well.